<clears throat> okay, everyone. I think we'll uh, we'll start off because we we only got an hour, and we would like to uh, to keep that time frame because I'm sure uh, uh, there's some busy people out there. So um, first of all, um, welcome. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. We've got something like well, we've got now 33 attendees, uh, 33 delegates, and I expect that to go up a, a little bit as well. Um, this is the uh, first webinar from the Humber branch of the Energy Institute. Um, and it's it's also our first technical event for some time, obviously with with COVID nineteen. So we're really pleased to be to be back up and back up and running. Uh, the webinar is, um, as it says on the screen, decommissioning in a in a nutshell. Um, and um, just a couple of bits of admin before we start. Um, you are all on mute, and um, I'm, I think yep, and all videos are off. We are recording, so um, please um, please note that we are recording this, and we will hopefully be hosting this on the uh, uh, Energy Institute uh, website, and uh, we'll hope to, if we can, we'll get it out on social media as well. Um, we're hoping to get a PDF of the uh, the slides as well, uh, which we, again we will host on the uh, on the website on the Energy Institute website under the Humber branch. My name is David Talbot. Um, I'm the chief executive of uh, CATCH, which is a, 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 an industry membership and skills body uh, um, situated in the, the Humber, Humber region, just outside Grimsby. Uh, and that's where we're talking from you today. It's great that we've got the presenters with us on site um, and that uh, we're not actually at, at, at home, which is uh, great news that we can start to get out and about and uh, try and get back to a little bit of norm normality if we can. Um, just sticking with admin um, questions, if you could use the Q&A slot um, uh, on the, uh, the webinar software and uh, we will uh, run through questions at the end. But as I said, we are trying to keep the, the, the hour. Um, so we'll, we'll see how the questions go. If we, if we run out of time, then I'll try and capture the questions and get them to the presenters and we'll, we'll, we'll push them back out um, afterwards. Uh, so, for those of you that are members of the Energy um, Energy Institute, um, I just thought I'd just highlight that uh, as a branch, the Humber branch, we are in the energy estuary here, um, and we've had a bit of a reset recently. Um, so, you, please look out on social media. We're, we're, we're uh, getting a lot of stuff out there on social media. Um, we're trying to revitalise and refresh our, our program of events. And what's really exciting for me is that we are starting um, a um, a young professionals network for the Humber branch as well, which is which is genuinely really exciting news for us. So again, look out for, for more on that as, as we move forward. And we're also as a branch trying to reach out to other branches to identify um, areas for best practice. And we've been talking to the Yorkshire branch and we will be reaching out further as well. So watch out for the for this for that space. Uh, those of you who are not Energy Institute members, uh, really love to have a chat with you about what the EI can offer. Um, so please, if you want to get in touch, then my email is david.talbot, T-A-L-B-O-T, uh, at uh, catch, as in a ball, uk.org, david.talbot at catchuk.org, or use the Humber branch uh, email, which is humber at energyinst.org. So please, love to hear from you. Uh, I don't intend to go on any more, apart from just to say we have two presenters uh, for you today. We have uh, Liam Jackson and uh, Dr. Elvis uh, Hernandez. I will leave them to introduce them uh, themselves and give you a bit of their background. But just to say, they have a wealth of, inf of, uh, of experience between them in the decommissioning sector uh, around project management and, and risk primarily. So I'll leave them to introduce themselves and I'll actually hand over to, to Liam and Elvis now to, to start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, David. So. Um... Decommissioning projects are very large projects. Um, we only have an hour today, uh, possibly 45 minutes, if we're going to get questions in at the end. So these are the topics that we uh, are looking to discuss, um, very high level. Um, by all means, do contact us if you would like us to discuss um, any other topics or these topics in more detail. I know we're now and then it's something we'll look to do, um, but today is just high level on, on these topics. So I'm William Jackson, I'm a Chartered Project Manager the APM. I've got 10 plus years experience in oil and gas, energy, chemicals and construction sectors. Um, I've recently worked for a Southern North Sea operator um, in which I was heavily involved in decommissioning projects offshore and offshore. Over to you, Elvis. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Liam. And again, David, thank you so much for the invitations. Uh, what can I say uh, a little bit from, from my side? Uh, I've been working in the energy industry for more than 18 years. Uh, I'm one of the top executive trainers in certified in quantitative risk management for the Energy Institute. And I've been working behind the decommissioning, especially from the data analytics and uh, software development to get uh, uh, the quantification of risk behind decommissioning projects. And for me, I'm really pleased for the invitation and sharing a little bit the information with, with you today. Uh, regarding this area, I would like to start um, checking with you guys because I, I, we want to, to make a little bit uh, a certain interaction with you. Um, decommissioning implies from one side large cash commitment for, from the companies, but nowadays represents a massive opportunity as well for helping asset operators to reuse the assets and integrate decommissioning strategies into the decarbonizations. So if you want to separate here between risk and uh, opportunities, what do you think from the asset operator perspective, the biggest problems or the two biggest problems right now behind decommissioning? What do, what do you think that's from, from your side? between cash and asset reuse, which one is the highest risk and which one is the highest opportunity? Please write in your chat so we can visualize right now that everything is running smoothly. Could you please check what is the risk? Put R in one of them and a opportunity in the other one. Just write in your in your chat, guys. I'm, I'm I'm watching here right now. What what are your answers? Anyone? Let me check here. Okay. Well, while some people are are replying, well, the massive risk behind the commissioning is because there is no saving associated with the commissioning. It's everything capital expenditure. Okay. However, nowadays we have strategies to visualize how the organization can start reducing the capital expenditure with better project management and all the information that we are going to share with us, uh, with you today. In addition to this, we have as an opportunity the other movement that we have around the markets green energy projects, renewables, decarbonization strategies, carbon capture, hydrogen projects, try to visualize how these strategies can be integrated into the, this massive uh, decision for organizations. So, today we are going to present two areas. One, the best practices and the methodology, what are the, me the best mechanisms uh, or the list of requirements the organization need to fulfill to decommission and how risk management can be integrated during that process. So you've got one point here, um, Elvis, which is cash and cash. And uh, cash. And <laughs> okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the first area that we, we are going to cover is strategies and um, for uh, start talking with, uh, about strategies you need to understand three main questions what what are they the first one is what do we know about decommission the second one what are the options for those people those organizations involved in decommissioning asset operators the owners of the liability of the commissioning and as well the regulator or the government because as a last resort if the company cannot fulfill all the, or the asset operators cannot fulfill this liability of course the government the regulator as a last resort they need to have that component 
And of course, the government need to use the taxpayers to do uh, this dismantling of or decommissioning of the assets. Okay. So first one, what do we know? The other ones, what are the options? And remember, there is another component they, that nowadays people are talking about this topic. Decommissioning can be early or can be late. Of course, from the traditional way, always organizations wait until the last minute to decommission the asset. But we are going to explain today that agile asset operators, agile managers, they are a star or they started to think about early decommissioning. So these are the three main areas or the thing, three main topics that we are going to discover today. Okay, what do we know about decommissioning? Most of the organization advising asset operators, governments, and as these, these, uh, most of the time are the oil and gas authorities in, in UK, but in other countries we have decommissioning uh, organization as well. They try to map where are the most relevant capital expenditure or the highest cost associated with decommissioning. And you can visualize right now from the benchmark perspective, what do you have there is information that on average, it could be more, more or less like that. Remember that those numbers have variability. Those numbers have risk because all of them depend upon what are the capabilities of the organization? What are the uh, strategies to dismantle, to cut, to leave the assets, to uh, uh, do the mobilization component, the demobilization component, the project management strategy. But right now, from this perspective, you can visualize that 80%, 80%, imagine a 100 million project, decommissioning project, 80%, are centralized uh, or are centralized by wells plug and abandon the removal conductor removal and the removal of the asset cutting lifting and so forth and project management dealing with contractors dealing with services so if you want of this organization want to start minimizing the cost of decommissioning, there is a massive opportunity for other companies associated, in, 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 associated with the supply chain to start thinking about and thinking around these three main areas. Top side removal, project management, how to do better project management services, and as well, how to enhance wealth, plug and abandon because this area, this area centralizes more or less 80%. Of course, when we implement, according to the information we have with a specific companies, what we are going to do, we run analytics. We get these risk profiles associated with these projects to visualize definitely what are the probability of hitting these numbers or being above these numbers or below these numbers according to, according with the, 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 to the information that they the company have or the asset operator has okay so this is what we know in decommissioning so if you want to visualize what are the options behind the commissioning because that is nice it's a really nice report to visualize more or less on average where is the capital expenditure associated with the asset operator but you need to visualize what are in the mind of the asset operators or the those people who has who have the liability of the commission. The first area, and let me put, uh, we have a really um, tangible red box here is late the commission. This is a, the normal way of dealing the commissioning. The last hundred years, fifty years, sixty years. And what is the, the what is the alternative? What are the options in late day commission? Is just waiting until the asset is uh, is not producing value anymore, or uh, the company by regulatory constraints they need to start dismantling the asset, pulling the asset, 
And what are the options? Well, the option can be three direct options. The first one, if the company sell the asset, okay, of course they cannot sell the liability, is before um, the, the decommissioning, the company or the asset operator decided to sell this company to another one, of course the liability is impl implicit. So whoever is buying has, is buying as well the liability. The second option is outsourcing the commissioning. Yes, uh, David, you have a really good company. Can you do the decommissioning for me? And I pay you, uh, of course, we need to negotiate re reimbursable, fixed contract or whatever, but I transfer that responsibility to you. And the last one is doing in-house. Many companies are start doing uh, these uh, routes to try to leverage certain capabilities, of course, in those asset operators that they have a lot of assets to dismantle in the future. Probably for them, it's a really good route to leverage the capability inside. But as well, right now, because it, there, there, there is a green energy around these areas and organizations are visualizing how I can, because if lay the commissioning implies huge cash that the organization need to put in place, of course, they need to immediately visualize how I can postpone, because if I have to put here a hundred million to take out the assets, it's possible for me as an organization postponing the decommissioning. For postponing the decommission, now we have many organizations, including the government, not only in UK, in United States, in Ghana, eh, Nigeria, Asia, and so forth. They are talking about how to integrate gas to wire, carbon capture, hydrogen into this massive eh, strategy because in the end, the cash is there, is how the organization are going to maximize that cash. In the book that we developed, eh, we also did a massive research, probably interviewing more than 200 people in the industry, revising papers and so forth, we noticed that right now, early decommissioning is getting a momentum. Early decommissioning means the organization don't need to wait until the end because at late decommissioning, you don't have a lot of options. But if you are able right now, in early decommissioning, you can do the following. You can maintain your assets, you can do better strategies to do reliability, maintenance, availability of the asset. Uh, you can do joint venture. You can uh, bring money from the government or other operators to invest in research and development, innovation, in how my assets that I need to decommission in, in 20 years, in five years, in 10 years, I can integrate my asset and try to visualize how I can bring new value for the organization, gas to wire, carbon capture, hydrogen, and so forth. So this is an important component. So the value that your organization, asset operator, can create in early decommissioning is massively. So in late decommissioning, the degree, the degree of freedom they have is really low. So the value that they can incorporate to the uh, business, to the shareholders, uh, stakeholders, and so forth, is really low but the options are there. In addition to this, you need to know right now what is the roadmap, okay? The roadmap is the following, okay? And this is everything is centralized right now and, be, uh, and after this, I think Leah is going to nail and going to give you a lot of details behind the methodology, the best practices behind the commission. So when we have this nature, this is a common project planning for uh, starting from feasibility, conceptual study, engineering, construction, uh, commissioning, up to decommissioning. Right now, what are the options for, for organization? Well, in let's say in the first, the first three, four, five years of construction of the asset, everything is capital expenditure. It's high. organization jump here and they try to minimize cost and time associated with the project management. The other extreme is when you are here, you have to take out the asset, you have to dismantle the asset. So you have on one side, the 
in this red area you have here is the capital expenditure. Is the project, the money you have to pay or the operator need to pay in order to fulfill the liability, okay? Dismantle the asset. In addition to this, of course, you have uh, here some blue areas with that means for those organizations, and we have information in the research we did, there are companies even getting 10, 20% of the residual value of the asset just because they did something really nice across the year. They maintain the assets, they clean the asset, they have the best condition in the platform, they try to control many things in order to make certain saving behind the residual value of the assets. But what is behind here as well, and this is the area that uh, we, we are visualizing here, be, between the construction of the asset and the decommissioning of the assets, we have a lot of changes here. And this is the area for early decommissioning. Start timing the markets in order to visualize what are the options behind here, in order to visualize what are the conventional and emerging decommissioning strategy behind here. Behind this point and this point, the organization need to do a lot of uh, information. They need to manage a lot of information. And this is why data analytics play an important role here. Liam is going to work right now and is going to tell you what are the best practices to deal with this massive capital expenditure you have at the end of the life of the asset. So, Liam. Thank you. So, I'll start with project management on a decom project. So, generally speaking, um, a decom process should start between three and five years before you're ready to lift the assets out and, and start the construction works or deconstruction works as the case may be. Um, but this can be short and longer depending on your, your schedule and the size of the assets. Um, and the team working on it. If you've got a really small asset and a, and a huge team working on it, you can do it a lot shorter. Um, and it can be a lot longer if you're, if you're planning well in advance as well. One of the key documents that you'll need is a decommissioning program, um, which is one of the main documents uh, for the project. And it's the one that's sent to the regulator for review and approval. A decommissioning program must identify all items of equipment, infrastructure, and materials that have been installed or drilled. Um, and describe the decommissioning solution uh, for each of them items. Quite a large document and includes a lot, but just to highlight a couple of uh, key bits of the schedule, the stakeholder, transportation, waste management, environmental, project management, verification items, uh, there's much more in it. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more on these, you can visit the, the government's website at the bottom there. Um, it talks about them. It also gives you some sort of standard templates of, of key documents that they expect to see. Other key documents in project management on, on a decom project, um, a roadmap, so a high level milestone schedule really um, over the years of, of what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. Supply chain communication policies and flow charts, you, the likely is you'll use a lot of contractors and contractor firms on these type of projects, so it, it's good to understand who, how, when. Um, Waste management plan, this is quite important to me. Um, ultimately tells you what waste you've got on your platform, um, which is good if it's an old asset, you're likely to have asbestos, um, asbestos registers that are sometimes not kept up to date, or you don't know about it because records have been lost over time. You know, you've got other stuff like norm, mercury as well. So you know, this is important. Your plant report for your, for your permits, your licenses, your consents, your notifications, very important. Comparative assessments for both subsea equipment, so that's pipelines, cables, uh, and anything else on the sea. Um, they're good documents to understand what you've got and what you're going to do with them, or whether you're going to leave them in place, and then what justification you believe you've got to leave them in place. Your cost estimate, very key, you know, that, that'll get better as you go through the engineering process, and if you get down to job card level, you'll, you'll be able to understand that, and you'll, you'll get it to plus or minus 10%, possibly. Um, Project schedule, again, uh, that'll get detailed as you go through the project. Project execution plan is a bit of a Bible, really, on, on how the project's going to run. So, you know, if, if the project manager for some reason left, somebody else could pick that up and they barely run with it. 
And then your, your environmental approval strategy, you know, environmental is huge in decommissioning, given uh, where you work in, generally speaking. Other key things in project management, just to be uh, high level, and uh, what I think is quite important is, is any of your licenses and anything you've got to follow up with regulatory bodies. Um, the CMP, for example, that must be put in, it's just one of them, but there's much more. You might have lease on the field, et cetera, that needs to be uh, given back. The size of the project as well, finances is huge. Um, Elvis showed earlier the, the sort of percentages for each element. Um, the business needs to understand, you know, how you're splitting your finances out over the years or over the months, even as you get closer. And, you know, is it a release at the start of a project or is it stage release during the project to see each stage? Again, that will be down to the companies um, and the organization budget management process. And then third parties I touched on earlier, you know, early engagement on them, they'll definitely help you have a successful project. You know, they're specialists in their areas, so um, use them uh, to the best of your abilities. Our next topic is engineering. So for me, this is the most important element. You know, if you get this wrong, that the project goes wrong, whether it's, it's towards the environment, safety, costs or schedule. So um, for me, you, you've got to do this correctly and get it right. So a full in-depth detailed design should be completed for each and every task that you're going to do in the decommissioning, you know, from preparation to cleaning the platform to lifting to, to transportation. Um, Generally speaking, you would get through all your, your current documents you've got, your drawings on your management systems, um, but a lot of the older assets who have you know, changed hands over time, these are always there. The surveys are really important, you know, waste material surveys, node inspection, lifting point inspections. These are the sort of surveys that you should be doing really early on and getting that data so you've got the best possible stuff to work with. So all engineering ultimately will lead to the construction work packs at the end of the day, which will be given to the teams offshore to complete the work. So um, very important stage for me, really. The commissioning engineering documents, you know, the survey reports that I've just touched on, top side removal reports, which will generate lifting models, um, structural calculations of the platform, um, detailed design packs, you know, which will get checked and verified. Uh, heavy lift and transportation studies, you know, where are you sailing your asset to, how are you sailing it, how are you lifting it onto the item that's going to sail it. Your well PA detailed designs um, and your programs for completing them, uh, inspection reports, uh, the list goes on. Um, it, it's a detailed list, and this is just a, a couple I've, I've selected out. And another important part is um, the schedule. Um, once you get down to construction packs, you, you know, you've got your lab itemized uh, list here, basically, of uh, how you're going to do the job from start to finish. And it's up to you to decide how much risk you want to apply to this schedule. You know, if you're doing this in the middle of December, I'd apply a bit more for weather issues. If you're doing it in the middle of the summer, you probably get away with a bit less. Um, but there's lots of other stuff, you know, you're in the North Sea, yeah, lots happens. Um, platform preparation. So there's a certain amount of work you have to do before you can lift these things. You, you can't just lift an asset and, and sail it in. There's, there's certain work. So I've selected a, a few that I think are quite fun. So a deep clean of the top side and its equipment, basically removing the hydrocarbons uh, from pipelines, tanks, vessels. Um, number of reasons, you know, when you lift the platform, you don't want these spilling into the ocean. And most waste yards on the beach do not want to receive them in a, in a muddy estate. They'd rather have them clean if possible. On the project I completed, we, we cleaned everything to 30 parts per million oil and water. Um, we got to that number by talking to the yards that were going to receive it, and um, they advised what they were happy to receive it in, and we sort of worked with that. Um, also, by doing this, you can lower your, your ongoing inspections and maintenance if you leave everything air gapped once it's cleaned. Um, it'll be just drop object sort of inspections you'll need to do um, on these items. Installation of lifting points and aids. You might be able to use the existing lifting points if they've been left on. Um, generally speaking, on one of the assets I was working on, they've been removed um, or cut or partly removed. So, you know, you, you could install new points at this point, or you could, you know, try and work with what you've got. But again, they need inspecting, they need checking, they're suitable. Um, again, every asset's different, so that that would be a, a key inspection to complete. And then there's quite a bit of design work out the back of that. 
dismantle of equipment that's no longer required. So it might be a module, it might be certain items, you know, lowering the weight of the overall lift. Um, you can do this while the asset asset's still live, it's still manned, it reduces the cost. You haven't got a heavy lift vessel sat next to you charging thousands of pounds a day. You can do it with platform cranes, even if, if they're capable of doing it. But it's quite a good one to think ahead and if you can get rid of certain elements, why not? Sea line preparations, if they're not in use anymore, um, you know, sort of interfield ones um, was one we did on a project uh, more recently. We, we picked it, flushed it, cleaned it, um, left it air gaps. Um, and, and the idea for that one was for it to be left in situ. So um, that's what they'll apply to do. So we, you know, get them ready, ready to go. We move the pig launcher, get it, get it ready to go. Loose item removal. So we removed anything that could roll around as a giant marble on lift. So from fridges to gym equipment, uh, shipping containers, and then we basically shut the door and locked it. So nothing else could be put in in the future. Um, quite important, removes a load of weight as well. Um, you'd be quite surprised how much has been collected over years on these assets. Um, stuff that's never been used, but has been left in cupboards or containers over time. There's other potential types of preparation as well. Um, every asset's different, like I said, you know, if you've got a small asset in the southern North Sea with two wells, it's going to be a lot different if you compare to the Brent Alpha, for example. Uh, the next topic um, is well PA, well pulled and abandonment. Very key topic, really. You know, generally speaking, wells um, are between 40 and 45 percent of the overall cost of the project. Um, so a very high cost, and if it goes wrong, that cost just continues to mount. So it is a huge topic for me, <clears throat> and we haven't got long to talk about it really, but you know, safety concerns when dealing with live wells as well is it, quite quite important. So try to just give you a very high level four phase approach to, to abandoning a well. Um, phase one is the preparation phase in which the well operation is suspended. Generally speaking, you're, you're flushing killer at this point and uh, try and remove any contaminated fluid in that well. Phase two, the reservoir is isolated or abandoned. Um, you sort of rigging up well equipment, uh, BOPs, removing the tubing hanger and tubing, installing a primary barrier over the reservoir, and then installing a secondary barrier as well. This gives you two barriers, which is, is most standard uh, for people. Phase three is the final phase of actual isolating and abandonment. Um, and at the end of this stage, your cluster is fully abandoned. So you're removing case and strings, you're installing any other barriers to potential flow zones. They'll all be determined in the design phase um, how many flow zones you've got on a well. Um, and you'll, you'll put barriers in that's a mechanical plug with a cement barrier above it. And then installing a, an environmental barrier, which is your, your very top one, uh, and basically quite low below the seabed there. And then phase four is removal of anything else that's left in place, well heads, conductors, um, et cetera. So here's a, just a quick diagram. Uh, the left-hand side is before PA, so that's a live uh, basic well on a platform, reasonably standard. And then the, the, the diagram on the right there has the primary and secondary and the surface plug. So just two barriers and then the surface plug, the three barriers in total on that one. As you can see, casing tubings removed uh, and Christmas tree and wellheads, et cetera, above sea, all removed. And then you have the conductor pipe, which is the main structure between the asset and the seabed connected to the well. Um, the pipe and its associated casings must be removed, generally speaking, 10 foot below the seabed. Um, but again, you can apply if you don't believe you can do that or you want to do something different. It all depends on where you're located and, and which regulator you're talking to within the world. Um, basically, this removes the pipe to the top of the asset. So this you know, doesn't cause a nuisance to sea traffic in the future then. It's below the seabed. Um, Maybe shouldn't cause any problems. You would normally sort of sever these into 40 foot casing sections and then remove them for disposal um, using explosive ID cutters, diamond wire cutters, abrasives, hand cutting, hot off hold. Um, again, every, it depends on who you're using to do it. And, and there's loads of new technologies coming out in the well world at the minute as well to, to speed these processes up and make them safer. The next one is platform removal and, and transportation. Um, you're very much detailed in your in your program of how you're moving it, how you're lifting it. Um, and it'll have gone through every check under the sun for lifting uh, structural wise. 
make sure it's capable and it, you know you're not going to collapse the crane or the platform's not going to fold in on itself as you're lifting. Um, you'll generally use a heavy lift badge to, to do a lot of this work, and there's lots on the market. Um, some monsters who can lift a lot. You know, you've got the Pioneer and Spirit there on the right, which is, is a very impressive machine. But you, you'll assess everything, your size, your weight, your center of gravity, your lifting methods. And it'll, it, every asset will be different. I don't think one model fits at all on this. Um, and there's different ways you can do it. You can just do a reverse construction. So basically, you move it in the opposite way to how it went in. You could do piece small. Um, you can do single lifts if it's a, a very small top side or even a large top side these days now. Um, like I said, the Pioneer and Spirit lifts everything in a one up. So uh, there's many different ways of uh, doing it now. And then for the transportation, um, there's a different ways to transport it back to the beach. You can drop it onto barges. Um, you can lift it in on the hooks of the heavy lift vessel. You can do a bit of both, depending on how many items it is. You know, it's all about your schedule and then making it as effective as possible, really, in transportation. So um, you've got to imagine where your nearest port is as well. That's going to take these items. So there's lots of different transportation. But again, it should all be lifted in your transportation method of what route you're taking, what you're using, you know, sea conditions that you can transport in, uh, wind conditions that you're lifting, etc. Subsidy commissioning. So this is talking about power cables, pipelines, uh, many other stuff that's on the seabed on assets in the North Sea. Um, you complete a comparative risk assessment on what you're going to do, um, and you know you can apply to leave pipelines in situ. Um, I don't see problem personally doing that. You know these these have been down there 20, 30, 40 years, some of them, um, and the environment around them has sort of grown with the pipeline as such. So actually removing it could cause more damage. Than leaving it. Um, but if you do leave it, it it's a company's responsibility still to ensure you know, that pipeline doesn't cause a nuisance to, to sea traffic or environment. So your comparative risk assessment would ultimately tell you what you're doing with it. And if you are removing it, there's various methods. Uh, you've got reverse reeling, a pipeline, S layer pipeline, cut and lift of the pipeline into smaller sections. Um, it all depends on where the pipeline is, water depths, um, size of pipe condition of height as well, you know, these things might bumble under you if they've been left and not been used for a long time. Onshore disposal. So generally speaking, the asset will come on shore. Um, there is a different things to do with the asset though. You know, if it's a seven year old asset, for example, and in really good condition, you might sell it to somebody else and they might pick it up and take it somewhere else in the world and reuse that top side or the jacket if it suits water depths, etc. Um, but generally speaking, in, 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 we're talking about decom, so we'll say it's come to the beach. Um, you'll have an approved vendor for, for recycling and waste management on, the, on shore at the ports. There's many in the UK, Norway, Netherlands, who will take these in and have the correct water depths as well for, for the vessels. Um, and then it comes on and it will ultimately be dismantled for scrap. Um, but there might be some items on there that are worth some, whether it's compressors, generators. Uh, I know on a project we had the wellheads were, were very old, and there was still a few assets in the North Sea use the same ones. So, you know, sort of sold them, and they were refurbed and uh, sold on as spares, um, which you can't get them anymore. They're not made. There's, there's plenty to do when it's on the beach, but generally speaking, you know, the pile of metal you see in the picture there is ultimately how it'll happen. And you, and you will get value for your scrap as well. So, you know, take that off your overall cost. Then in the future, you still have to monitor what you've left, you know, so the, the wells are fully abandoned and you want to expect to see any issues with them. But generally speaking, it's still the company's responsibility. If, if anything did leak back to surface from them, you would have to go and, and address that, that point. Um, pipelines left in situ, sort of 10 year period. But if you can prove there's no change in conditions and, you know, it's not causing any issues, then then you could with the regulators, but you know anything left is the organisation's responsibility. So you should have your your costs set aside for monitoring, and you should understand what schedule and justification to what schedule you're going to do that monitoring um, on. So that's me. So I'll hand you back to, to Elvis for the, the final. <clears throat> Thank you, Liam. Um, well, guys, behind here, I, I, I don't going to. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because I would like to give you more time to uh, make 
questions and as well sharing a little bit your uh, understanding on, on the topic. But what I want to mention here is behind the commissioning strategies, there are three main macro areas of risk. The first one is financial risk because um, the commissioning implies huge capital expenditure and uh, is money that the company is not going to use for financing operations. So they is, is, is a some cost. The other one, when the financial department and the manager and the stakeholders decided to go for the commissioning, they, when they commit with the budget, the rest is doing the best in project management in order to implement the project on their costs and under the time that they are expecting. So the first area, financial risk. The second area is project management risk. And the final area is non-financial risk. People, they try, so, 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 some organization, they put the non-financial risk like a, as a risk register, but be, be, based on the experience and the research we did, we realized that sometimes 20% of overrun in cost is because the organization have no plan it well in advance the non-financial risk impacts. We are talking about health, safety, environment, quality, and so on, okay? So quickly, the financial risk is try to understand the capital expenditure. When Liam talk about sea lines, platform preparation, operating and maintenance, waste and management, supply chain, engineering, safety, leaf, cutting strategies, we are talking about more than 25,000 uh, items of activity-based cost perspective around uh, at the commissioning strategy. This is why, Behind the organization and working right now, we decided to develop a decommissioning analytical, a set of algorithms, machine, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so forth. Nowadays, guys, if you need more information about these areas, please call David Tal Talbot because all these technologies right now uh, have been provided by education, professional development as a part of the cash, cash skills programs in order to provide that information right now. So what we did behind this one, when experienced professionals or project managers like Liam eh, provide us what are the, all the items to plan the financial risk, we put all this information here, and with that information, we immediately get the sense of the risk profile of the financial perspective. What is the, the probability of having values be, below? For example, if the benchmark said that based upon of this condition, the asset is the decommissioning, this type of asset is 100 million. Based on the information we have and the uncertainty associated with that information, what is the probability that that project overrun on cost? In addition to this, we are able to integrate other capabilities, other options, reuse of the asset in order to visualize how much in the future if that company decided to rent the pipeline for carbon capture or they have a really nice wealth integrity, how much value can incorporate the company when they are start or they start integrating other options in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the decommissioning strategies. So all this information, you can obtain it immediately, in minutes, in seconds, in order to visualize what are the risky drivers behind the financial perspective. The second area is the dynamic project management, is when the organization commits with the funds, with the money, so the rest is understanding how the project plan is going to be implemented and based on this information they can immediately using the analytics that we develop they can understand what is the risk profile on cost and time and as well what are the main activities driving the cost risk and the time risk of the project 
So in certain organization, not necessarily, this is why when Leon said, for example, wealth, plug and abandonment, sometimes can cost 40% 40 40 of the budget. But if the company or the asset operator has important capabilities and experience behind managing that area, of course, probably that's are not going to be the key risk driver of the project. And these are the type of analysis we try to map across the project plan and in order to determine what are the most critical risk factors driving or affecting the project. So in addition to this, the organization immediately before way in advance implementing the project, they can introduce certain flexibility. What happened if the project, the original project was using uh, this type of cutting strategy? And we decided to use uh, water uh, cutting, or we are going to use diamond cutting, or we are going to use explosive, I don't know. So we are able to map all this flexibility in the project from the risk management perspective. The final one is using the risk register, the HACCP studies, the ALARP studies that organization uses because it's really difficult when you, the organization map 25 risk items are in red, but what is the real impact on the project or the financial perspective? We use all this information from the risk register and we quantify that information. We get what is the additional cost or time implication or financial implication when the organization doesn't have any health or certain condition associated with health, safety, environment, quality that might affect the project with certain probability. We quantify, we use data analytics for that type of analysis. So with that, the final area that I want to show you here is we are looking for, for active management perspective. People and organization thinking way in advance in, on risk, and try to visualize how the assets, the decommissioning capability can be postponed and as well, how they can start timing this process. Never underestimate the non-financial risk because that can have massive implication on the project. Always update, update and update. The projects and the financial uh, management behind the commission is not an static process. Always change the weather conditions, people inside, a mobilization perspective, a health implication, all these areas. And we have all, nowadays COVID impacting also organizations that they were thinking right now in how to be commissioning this year and next year as well. Safety first, cash scheme, and strategic risk is adding success to this type of project. Liam, could you please provide? Just some of the information quickly, so I'm merely mindful <clears throat> that was a lot of information. Um, and to be honest, there's still a lot missing that we didn't talk about. Um, and I've spent all day talking about decommissioning there and, and the technical side. So, all the different bits, you know, we didn't even touch on closeout, for example, of a decom project, and then there's much more. So, if there's anything you want to know or, or would like to know from me, uh, my email address is there. By all means, contact me, ask me a question, um, and I'll get back to you um, as quick as I can. Um, and myself, Elvis, a uh, uh, nice gentleman from California called Jonathan Munn, wrote a book on decommissioning and risk. So um, it does explain in technical sections plus the, the risk sections that Elvis has just spoke about. It's available on Amazon or you can contact me about that. But by all means, just drop me an email if there's something you'd like to know. Um, Again, um, from uh, and this is a, a good surprise for all of you because this is totally new. It was not in the initial information we had uh, before uh, planning this webinar. Uh, CATCH and OSL Analytics Academy, supported by the International Institute of Professional Education and Research, they brought to United Kingdom and uh, coordinated by David Talbot the first decommissioning professional qualification uh, that covers all the areas that uh, Liam was talking and also as well the risk management component. What I want to say here, um, CATCH is investing in this, this uh, um, 
a strategy behind the commission, how companies are creating value and saving money. And not only the technologies, all the knowledge that we have in place with talking and working with many organizations as well. Please contact David through info at catchuk.org. And because uh, probably by September, October, we formally, we are launching this program. David. Okay, th thanks very much. And uh, yeah, I just want to say that I'm uh, really excited to be working with, with OSL uh, and IOPR in, in, in developing and marketing uh, this, this new opportunity. So really exciting. And uh, we will be reaching out to, uh, to catch members, EI members and wider stakeholders to, uh, to, to uh, to kind of advertise that in due course. So yeah, really exciting step forward. Um, thanks very much uh, to Liam and Elvis for, uh, for presenting to us today. I hope you found that uh, you know, an informative run through of the project management, uh, risk quantification and uh, true life kind of uh, valuation of assets during decommissioning. We've got uh, about eight minutes. <clears throat> so um, I welcome any questions that anybody may have. Um, we've got nothing come through at the moment, uh, but if you do have any questions, um, please uh, put them down on the, the question block. Please, uh, guys. Uh, uh, so, have... do you want to run through that one? I can't see all of them on uh, here. Well, uh, Liam, if can you see for it? me to drive that? Okay. Um, the first one. Um... Oh, so there are a few oh, questions. Well, we have a... yeah. Okay. Justin, um, environmental concern is one of them uh, opportunities. Um, yeah, that was from your question right at the okay, beginning. Okay, yeah. uh, risk of it not being understood. Yeah, that's, that's again from your question from the beginning. Unfortunately, we lost the, the chat during the presentation, okay. so I do apologise. <clears throat> Elvis, you mentioned that agile operators decommissioning early cash flow scheme is yeah. pushing further out. We always win financially. Second, decommissioning all at once is more cost effective. Third, the commissioning late leave optionality uh, for future reuse thoughts. Okay, well, uh, well, uh, Liam, what are you thought a little bit about the early and um, late decommissioning? What are so, your thoughts? So yeah, generally, um, people want to kick it to the bank. Um, nobody wants to spend money on something that doesn't make money. Um, and decom, unfortunately, you've made all your money previously. Um, you might not put as much to one side as you would like. You might have spent it all, and now you're digging into your pockets to, to decommission an asset. Um, especially if you're a small operator um, and you, you can't rely on your other quality assets to generate your cash. So, generally speaking, people would like to kick it to the right. Um, pros and cons and everything, I suppose. Um, you know, taxpayers do pay a lot of money towards decommissioning. You know, you sort of forty percent relief. So. Um, it's good for us as taxpayers as well if it goes to the right, I suppose. But um, you leave it to the right as well. Like I think somebody did mention there that you might be able to find a reuse for it. And you, you know now you've got your gas wired. But more importantly, I think that's coming to the market is your carbon capture and storage, which a lot of these reservoirs in the North Sea might be suitable for. And the assets, you know, you need a pipeline and assets pump, pump it into the ground. So these assets could definitely work on that for me. And then hydrogen is going to be huge, I think. Um, in, in this sector, so do we need places to store hydrogen? And uh, some of the reservoirs in the North Sea are suitable for storing gas, so can they store hydrogen? I don't know the answer to that. Um, but there is possible reuses in any amount of wind farms that are going up. Could we use our assets as your main block for them? Um, because a lot of them are going very close to oil and gas assets anyway, so could they reuse them? Um, so, yeah, moving to the right chip does give you time to, to, to evaluate what you can do with that asset. Um, but then planning well in ahead and, and booking vessels um, in downturns like the COVID could save you money as well. So um, not that you would know COVID was coming, but you know, the outfall of COVID, yeah. it might be quiet going forward at the minute. And there's lots of pros and cons to each, I suppose, in each organisation. Yeah. Well, actually, your point about hydrogen leads to the, the next question that we've got from, from Justin, which is, uh, what's the relationship between infrastructure adaptation to climate change and decommissioning? So it kind of links to what you're saying there in terms yeah, of yeah, you know, I, I think a lot potential of use for hydrogen storage. Could have a future, especially I think carbon carbon capture carbon and storage is, is the one for me where these assets will probably we're going to put carbon somewhere and why not yeah. use yeah. it as well. And I wanted to mention as well that climate change is, is an important driver for making asset operator to think seriously on asset integration. 
However, uh, at the same time, is uh, climate change is affecting and actually is related to the, the initial point. That's uh, how climate change is also impacting decommissioning. Of course, uh, for extreme weather conditions, climate change, and we, uh, we know that, so for example, in United States, New Mexico, and Gulf of Mexico specifically, they have been experiencing uh, important delays because of the hurricanes and all these type of things because of this climate change. And of course, uh, these are elements that need to be uh, quantified as a part of the impact. It's more or less what uh, Liam mentioned. If you decided to uh, start planning the decommissioning process and you have the winter in the middle of the project, uh, for sure you are going to experience some, de some delays. That is impo important areas to take into account. I think the other thing just to mention as well is that you know some of these really old assets, you bought a year plus. Mm -hmm. Have to be designed to last this long and what modifications do they need to be upgraded to suit for uh, carbon and uh, storage and hydrogen etc so you know uh, there's climate change changes are you likely to get rogue waves more often are you likely to get heavier rainfalls for longer periods or, or hotter heat temperatures that causes problems as well so it's a difficult one and and obviously you're doing studies and you're doing studies to suit Okay, no, no more questions at the moment, but just in case anyone does have any, we have got a couple more minutes. So I'd just, I'd just like to ask one to, to Elvis, actually. Okay. Um, so what do you see as the, the advantages and disadvantages of having a, a kind of an integrated uh, risk management system uh, in decommissioning initiatives? Yeah, well, you have two important areas here. Uh, the, from my perspective, and actually uh, based on the evidence we have from the research and also the practical application of integrated risk management, is mainly uh, companies can see the value, can be can visualize and quantify what is the potential savings and the potential value creation behind the commissioning strategies. So I start thinking way in advance early decommissioning and visualize what are the risks uh, associated with that strategy can add value to the company. The biggest uh, disadvantages I, I can visualize is for those people that um, still they see risk management as a, as a checklist or a to-do list component or compliance process, or they like to work in silos because the integrated risk management, it makes people more accountable. You have the risk, you have the risk profile of this project. So what do you need to do? So what is your strategy? So you are implying and forcing the organization to think about risk. And this is a little bit of the disadvantages for, for those people that are, in, uh, are working for long generation in this type of um, assets. Thank you. Um, and just final one, very quick answer Liam, from me. Um, what's the size of this um, yeah, as a task? I mean, do, do you think the decommissioning sector is going to be busy in the next few years? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of assets worldwide. Mm. There's, there's hundreds in the Southern North Sea and, and the Northern Sea just for the UK sector. Um, but then you take the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Norway, and everywhere else into consideration. Mm. Um, you know, early uh, the, the low gas and oil prices currently might force people to bring it forward. So we, we might see a spike in business coming going forward now. Um, but yeah, it, it's a busy sector, you know, there's, every asset's got to either go through decom at some point in July, even if it's be used for, for carbon in the future or hydrogen, you know, it's got to be decommed thereafter at some point, unless, you know, somebody changes the rules and you're allowed to leave them to lot, yeah. um, which I don't see the case being. So yeah, so, uh, it's a busy sector and I think it'll get busier. Yeah. Thanks very much. I don't think we've got any more questions, so we'll probably call it a day there. It's a good time to do so. So thanks again to uh, to Liam and Elvis for presenting Thank you very much. to us today. Um, thank you. And all I want to finish off by saying is thank you to the Energy Institute for, for uh, helping us to host this uh, this event for you. I hope you found it um, interesting thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, and a reminder that the video, hopefully, will be on the, um, the Humber branch uh, web page of the Energy Institute uh, website. Um, and we'll hopefully put the, uh, the presentation up as well if we're able to, uh, I'm sure. Uh, so have a look at that. And again, if you are interested in joining uh, or interested in the work of the, the Humber branch, then, then please, please get in touch with me.
thanks again for listening. Uh, hope you've enjoyed the event and uh, goodbye. Thank you.